Hi, this is Simon Nicholl from Fairport Convention with John Broughton on his programme Retrospectives, KC Radio's 97.7 FM. I went down to the hiring fair for to sell my labour. I noticed a maid in the very... Now, you've just got back from your annual reunion festival. Tell us how it went this well, year. Well, we're not... We're not. <laughs> Well, I didn't have to travel very far because uh, the festival is in a village called Cropperty, which is only about 15 miles from where I live, and is even closer to uh, Woodworm HQ, a little village of Barford St. Michael. So uh, we're we're actually still tying up the loose ends that inevitably re- occur when you have a weekend-long festival. It does take about 10 months of the year to organise it in advance, and then a couple of weeks afterwards for the, uh, for the dust to settle. And uh, how did this year go compared to others? It was brilliant. I mean, last year was, I think, um, uh, everybody would recognise was the largest we'd ever had. Um, We've been having a cooperative festival of of, uh, as an annual event since about 1973 or four. So we're quite long in the tooth, and and, uh, you know it's an established part of of the Oxfordshire scene here, as well as being a bit of the biggest um, European festival celebrating that kind of music. But that's only because it's grown from a very small beginning. But last year was the 30th birthday of the band, and we did build a bigger boat and push that out further, if you like. <laughs> but this year was like scaled down a little bit. It went back to what it the way it was in 1996, which which is really perfectly sized. Yeah, we had about 16,000 in. It must be a really unique atmosphere at the festival as well. Well, it is because you know you say sort of the words rock festival or you know festival. I'm sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> You say rock festival or festival in a field, and, and then people have this idea of um, a sea of, of unkempt hippies wallowing in mud. You know, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it's uh, very much an exception to the general rule of, of the Glastonbury's and the Reddings and so forth. It, it, it is a, a family-oriented festival, and most of the people that, that get together as part of the audience are, um, are, are, you know, they've already put it in their diaries for next year. Cool. Who else was on the bill this year with you? Uh, we well, we managed to get. Um, we finally, after about ten years of special pleading and, and groveling and so forth, we managed to get Loudon Wainwright, who's uh, oh, one of my personal heroes, and yeah. uh, we've we've never quite pulled it off before. But um, that was that was the treat for me. And a wonderful uh, crossover English band who are um, half Rastafarian um, and half sort of. Uh, squeeze box driven folk music called E2 I don't know if they've ever been out to, to play for you but no. they're one of my favourite bands too um, and I'll tell you who went down very well on the Saturday afternoon was a man called Fling who we uh, I think we met in Fremantle in 1996 when we were over oh, right. so you know and we have about half a dozen other acts on and it's just the Friday and the Saturday and uh, lots of fun was had you find the audience. The weather was fine. Oh, that's <laughs> a bonus. English, yeah, quite something. <laughs> <laughs> are you finding the audiences are coming from far and wide for the festival each year? They do. Yeah, I mean that's what I mean. There, there is a. There is a. It, it, it's not the kind of audience that would worry Michael Jackson. You no. know? But on the other hand, there's a tremendous loyalty felt towards Fairport um, in the little enclaves where where we have a recognition and. Um, Obviously, we have our, I, I suppose our core following is, is probably in this country. Um, wherever you go in the world, um, there are people who are just delighted to see you back again. You know? Yeah, well, sure. We've got a good following in, in um, that triangle in the United States, really, between Boston and Toronto and Washington. That's a very strong area for us. Um, we've been doing more and more work in Germany and Italy of late. Um, and we're hoping to come out, as you know, to Australia uh, just after Christmas this year. That'd be terrific. When was the last time out here? It was a while ago now, wasn't it? It was 96. 96. Was the last time we were over, yeah. Oh, well, we are well truly due. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a good trip. Now, Fairport's a band that's had so many comings and goings over the years. I, I guess in interview situations like this, is it difficult for you to keep tabs on, on a history as such? <laughs> well, I... Occasionally you meet interviewers who, who actually know much more about the band than you do, <laughs> or more than you can remember. Yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, it, the, the history may look a little complicated, um, but you have to remember it, there are a lot of activities that are crammed into those 30 years, 30 plus years now. And if you took a comparable situation, perhaps um, a small office or a, you know, a store or something, which employed four or five people at any one time, 
if you took a 30-year history of that place, that would probably be much more turbulent than uh, the comings and goings that have occurred in Fairport. It's just that, I suppose, if you look at the record output that we've had and, uh, and the various other documented ways of looking at a band, it's more obvious that, that people have come and, and been replaced and moved on. But that's a natural thing. It's, it, it's more like a family than a shop, I think. Mm -hmm. The same thing would happen in a family. Yeah, people like die, people get born, people get married and move away, you know? Yeah, excellent answer, yeah. Um, what would be, if you had to put it down to one thing, a key element in, in the band's survival all this time, would it be that, that family unity about the band? Well, I know, I, that's a chicken and egg. I don't know which one really did come first. But I would suggest that one of the main reasons we've survived this long and that we're not trading on any past glory, that we're a legitimate working band, is because we've never actually had um, a notable degree of business success in the uh, generally accepted meanings of that in, in the music business. We've never had a great payday where we've, you know, come out with an album which has sold five million copies across, you know, the whole world and then, then we'd, of course, the inevitable consequence of that is you're faced with the, that difficult problem of the follow-up record and yeah. uh, your, your career is perceived to be in decline if you, if you fail to overtop it and the next one. Mm. So that's why bands tend to burn out. I mean, there are a few exceptions to that rule, but that's the way things happen um, in successful bands. Um, whereas if you just sort of tick along quietly in a sort of slow lane that's kind of just parallel to the, the mainstream of the music business, then uh, you can survive. And of course, the older we've got, of course, the, older we've got um, the more experience we can bring to bear on our own organisation. We're fortunate in that we're, as a band, Fairfield Convention is, is autonomous now. We we do all our own managerial work, uh, quite a lot of our own promotion, and we, you know we have our own label. And <laughs> nobody would really want to manage us because we actually know more about the business than most of the people who are in this field of management. Because mm. most of those are, are, are younger, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's why we've survived. But. Yeah. It's like the old, um, if, you've got a, if you've got an angle on everything, then, then you've only got yourself to blame if it goes wrong, and you can sit back and be sensible about it. Let's go back in a bit of history and talk about, first of your musical involvement before, Fair, before Fairport. Well, I was in school, really. I mean, uh, I, um, I started playing the guitar um, in the early to mid 60s just because it was a cool thing to own you know it was something it was a it was a token of, of of being a little bit older than a child you know you you had a guitar and you could learn a few chords from your friends and the beatles were out and everybody could learn three or four chords and it was a phase that you know it wasn't that expensive to get involved in being in a band back in those days you could do it for you know you could buy a van for instance for 25 pounds that would get you to a gig um so it was a phase that lots of youngsters of my generation went through, and uh, you know, they tried it, they liked it, or they didn't like it, and they dropped out, or they went to college, or they moved on in life. And um, some of the unfortunate ones amongst us got stuck with it because of you know the accidents of where you have to play or who you have to meet, and you know one thing and another. It was a hobby that turned into a job, and then the job became a career. And now I guess I'm kind of stuck with it because <laughs> you know I'm singularly unqualified to do anything else. Was there an original set blueprint for the Fairport stand, or was that something that more or less uh, involved over time? Uh, I, at the time we were we were coming together, we, we didn't want to sound too much like the generic Mersey Beat kind of cover band, which was in um, 1965, 66, 67 would have been the average case that was what most that was the repertoire that most of the other garage bands down my street would have been playing um we were lucky there because one of the founder members of the band was a guy called ashley hutchings who is um, still involved in the business and still runs the albion band and is, is hugely creative uh intellectually and musically and he had um I suppose a guiding hand on the tiller in those, those early days and steered us towards more unconventional sources of material. We were doing things from Gus Cannon's Jug Band, um, even before the Lovings 
spoonful came along, you know, and, and sort of pointed that, that that was a legitimate source of material. Um, we were, I suppose, in the early days, much more American-oriented than most of our contemporaries. And indeed, the name Fairfield Convention, which sort of appeared somehow by magic after we tried several others in 1967, had a kind of West Coast feel to it, um, which probably helped us a bit in the beginning, because, you know, when there was just a list of bands that a uh, promoter might book, we sort of kind of sounded a little bit like alternative and West Coasty and, you know, maybe Jefferson Airplane ish, you know? Yeah. But um, once we once we made our first album and become legitimate professionals, if you will, then we were fortunate that Sandy Denny joined our organisation, and the possibilities of exploring traditional music, which she was a bit of an expert in in those days, and which was certainly an avenue of interest for Ashley and myself, became um, it. It became a tangible possibility, and that's that's I suppose when we started dabbling in traditional music and and the folk rock thing, which is the the tag which if anybody saddles us with any kind of a name is is the one that people refer to. Sure. Do you recall your first gig at Fairport? I think the legends have it. Your first drummer lasted only that one one gig. What happened there? That's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was the first gig at Fairport was um, in May 1967 in a church hall in Golders Green, North London, not far from where. We all lived. I mean, we all grew up in North London. And um, our drummer at the time was a chap I'd been at school with called Sean Freighter, who was, you know, an enthusiastic amateur. Obviously, we were all enthusiastic amateurs. But uh, there was another gentleman in the audience, another youngster from North London who we hadn't met before, but who was at school with a friend of ours who'd brought him along. And... um, his name was Martin Lambo, and he owned the drum kit too, and he quite fancied being in our band after he'd seen the very first gig. So he came up to us after the show and introduced himself and said, um, I'd really like, you know, I think I could do that job better. <laughs> what about, you know, give us a chance? So we did. We, we gave him a, a tryout the following week, and, and he became our drummer. So, you know, poor old Sean only ever did one gig with Fairport. <laughs> but then Martin himself uh, tragically was killed in the in the van crash that we had a couple of years later. And uh, you know, that was a bad sort of coming home from a gig accident. And um, it's unbelievable to think that, you know, we lost him that soon and so young. Now you mentioned Sandy Denny earlier. Uh, do you recall when and where you first came across, uh, across her talents? Uh, I'd never actually met her or seen her perform until she turned up at the audition. But I knew her name, um, and I knew her reputation, and I knew lots of people who knew her. So uh, at the time we were auditioning girl singers, um, they were, I think, the other eight or nine girls that we saw over the two-day period. They were all anonymous. She came with a, a little bit of a, you know, a shadow of expectation falling behind her. Um, and indeed, when she opened her mouth and started singing, we were all sitting around in a circle in a, in a youth club in Fulham. Uh, it was obvious that, that she was the only candidate. Mm. <laughs> and um, not just because of her, view, her voice and um, the breadth of her existing repertoire and so forth, but uh, she had a clearly developed vivacity and, and personality where she wasn't just going to come in as a sort of I'll, I'll be your girl singer and I'll do what you tell you kind of vibe there was definitely a feeling of an equal member from that moment on and, and a full contributor and you know a, a powerful resource and a fund of, of ideas and, and performance so we were very fortunate to meet her and, and we hit it off straight away now, was there any particular process in those early days in choosing the, the traditional folk material to cover? I mean, I'm, obviously you mentioned, mentioned Sandy had a great knowledge of, of this material. Uh, yeah, she did, and, and it was rehearsed up. Um, I think Ashley probably knew as much as she did, but of course he wasn't a singer himself, but he was very um, widely read on the, on, the, on the traditional canon. Uh, so between them, 
they they fairly quickly worked out a system where they would uh, decide which which traditional songs were appropriate. But that wasn't really at the essence of what we were doing in those days. What we wanted to do was incorporate the ideas of traditional music mm -hmm. rather than the songs themselves and try and not rewrite, but to write a new set of songs um, using some of the ideas and values of the tradition. Did it at any stage become a dilemma of uh, choosing between which way to go? Because there was obviously a great deal of songwriting talent within the band as well. It did develop that way. I mean, yeah. Sandy and Richard started writing together. Ashley was uh, spurred on in his own way as well. And, of course, when Dave Swarbrick was incorporated, he became um, a, a very close writing partner with, with Richard Thompson. I think there were problems later on, but not until we'd made our fourth album, Legion Leaf, which I suppose was the, you know, I've seen that referred to as the watershed album, the, the you know, the, the moment when folk rock was finally sort of emerged from the womb mm. uh, in this country and of course fairly soon after that record came out we, we, were, we were faced with the, that challenge of the, the next record and which direction to take it and um, the world was opening up for us and what happened there was a, a sort of a minor hiccup there was a bit of an explosion within the band and, and um, suddenly Sandy left and then Ashley left as well uh, because of, well, I suppose Sandy left really because she didn't know whether she wanted to be part of a touring band that was going to be out of the country doing American trips and things like that on a regular basis. And Ashley left because he felt that we should really get much deeper into the, the traditional angle of what we've been doing. And he didn't have that fellow feeling from the rest of us. We wanted to be more contemporary, more you know, to use the ideas of, of rewriting the songs rather than just performing them. But he went off immediately and founded Steel Ice Band, who made, whose first couple of albums, I think in particular, uh, are tremendous works of, of investigation that, that breathe life anew into um, material which was largely only available either on paper in libraries or in rather restricted performance areas in folk clubs by solo acts. Uh, it wasn't being developed or um, really that well presented, but still I managed to do it. You mentioned Watershed albums earlier. At what point do you feel the band really came of age musically? I think probably the, the second album, yeah. um, what we did in the holidays, that, that I think has in it all the elements which show... Um, the strength of the band at that time, um, the strength of the, the songwriting, the inclusion of some traditional material, the creative use of studio technology, which at the time now, obviously, you know, from 30 years later, you'd obviously laugh at it, but, but you know, we were actually doing quite a lot of complex work on four tracks and making it sound um, extremely polished, I think flattering myself rubbing my own back <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah I would say the second album shows that the band was more than just um, one of those little passing things yes. when did you get the first inklings that uh, that Richard Thompson was looking at leaving I was a bit surprised when he did leave um, I we were all living together at the time we all had uh, the five of us and two of our road crew and various associated wives and girlfriends and indeed children were living in uh, a rented ex-pub in uh, Hertfordshire. And Richard, at the time, was, was obviously exploring a number of intellectual disciplines, let's say, that, that um, he was growing as a... As a uh, uh, as an autodidact, you know, he was he was teaching himself stuff all the time. He had a very open mind, and his life was less obviously focused on the doings of Fairport Convention than perhaps the rest of us. I mean, I'm just a simple hedonist myself, so I'll, I'll go along with the band, you know. But, <laughs> but Richard would 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 be in his room educating himself in the art of songwriting, in particular, or going out and spending hours and hours. Um, 
practicing archery for you know the mental discipline of that things like that and he was literally going through that process where you have to write a thousand songs and tear them up uh, before you write your first decent one <laughs> and he would be in his room with reams and reams of paper and, and he'd come out and he'd go to the gig and we'd do the gig and he'd come back and he'd go back to his room and he'd start writing more songs so we, we knew that there was <sighs> something brewing there yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, he, he, he was applying some of it to the doings of the band, but um, it was obvious that Richard was uh, feeling like it was getting close to be time to, to do something new with his life. He, you have to put it in context of he'd already been in the band for three and a half years Yeah, at a time of his life when he was only just turning 20. You know, So that's a big section of your life when you're only that young. Now, you took over lead guitar duties at that, at that point. Was uh... Well, we thrashed around for a bit. We yeah. didn't know. We, we, we considered the idea of replacing Richard, but there just wasn't anybody close enough to hand um, that we felt confident in or, you know, that, that we felt wouldn't... It would be more like rocking the boat than just carrying on with the, the guys who already were established, were living under one roof, that knew the, the repertoire. It was just a bit of a bite-in-the-bullet situation for me because I mm. was... Um, perceived myself as, as part of a, a guitar section rather than the only one, the exposed one. And I certainly never um, led anything while Richard was, was standing next to me because that would have been preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we tried it by default, really. It was the easiest of the, you know, the, the, the two options before us. And it went down very well. The first couple of gigs went fine and the others were very encouraging. So we carried on, and we became a, a very happy four-piece for, well, another two albums, numbers six and seven, um, which were the first two we'd managed to make with an unchanged lineup. And then um, something happened to me, and I decided it was time for me to be elsewhere. So I left the band at the end of 1971. Was there any main contributing factor to that? Just did you fate? Uh, well, I'd never really understood why people wanted to leave Fairport until it happened to me. And then it was just like, it was just, I was, I remember we were doing a gig in San Antonio in Texas, um, we were sort of halfway through Sloth. We were supporting traffic on an American tour. And, uh, you know, about halfway through the set and I just sort of looked around at the stage and the crowd and I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, at the time I was elsewhere. And that was it. I just sort of, suddenly I wasn't in the band anymore. There were still lots of gigs to be done, obviously, and I couldn't go home straight away. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was a momentary insight, and I didn't regret it. You know, it didn't. It didn't. I didn't go to bed and then worry about it. I was like, sort of, hey, I'm not in the band anymore. I've got to do something else with my life now. I don't know what, but that phase is over. So um, I don't really know if there was an individual spur. It was just probably. Uh, time in my life to move on. Just the thing to do at the time. Over the years, Fairport members have been quite active in solo works outside projects away from the band. Do you think uh, this has been helpful in, in maintaining an enthusiasm for keeping Fairport going? Very definitely. Yeah? Yeah, the fact that the band has not been on a 12-month year footing, really, um, since 1979, I suppose, when we, when we did draw the line in the ledger and, and say that was the end of it. We were, you know, then we put the band onto a kind of reunion-only footing for about five, six years, and then when it came back after the Gladys's Leap record of 1985, we began, um, you know, everybody was involved in other projects. I mean, Dave Pegg was deeply involved in Jethro Tull, for instance, for 16 years. So it was impossible for Fairport to just, <clears throat> excuse me, it was impossible for Fairport to really consume so much of our time that none of us as individuals would have the opportunity to do other stuff outside, you know, extracurricular. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, and again, it's another reason for the band's continuing longevity because, all right, it's our home band, it's our family that we come back to, but, you know, you don't want to be with your family all the time, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get out and about, and um, playing with other people on other projects is a very invigorating uh, musical experience because everybody hears things slightly differently and if you just worked with one drummer all your life it would be just like you know the same as just deciding that you were only ever going to eat steak you know you, 
do have to have other food, and that's what makes everything more interesting. How do you feel about labels and categorizations being placed upon the bed? Well, I think we, we've come to live with the fact that we're saddled with this, this tag of folk rock now. Yeah. Um, I don't mind that, as long as they spell our name correctly. Um, <laughs> And as we've got older, obviously there's, you know, there are several other generations now beneath us in the pecking order or the, or the time order rather, who are inevitably going to look at us and, and see us as stale old dinosaurs who just sort of are going through the motions. Um, those people tend not to be the ones who come to the gigs and see what the band does mm. or just have a kind of um, rather dated and stale image of what we do. How do um, descriptions like a Grateful Dead without the drugs sit with you? Well, I was never much of a Grateful Dead fan <laughs> myself. <laughs> and I certainly was never a drug fan myself, <laughs> I should add. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, people are going to draw comparisons. And, yeah. and like, like most allegorical things, they're only partly true. You know, there's only... A, a, you know, there, there, are, there are more differences between us and other bands than, than similarities. Now, uh, you celebrated the 30th anniversary last year with an extended tour. Were yeah, there any... Party, but I mean, the main, the main thing was that was the Property Festival. Yeah. Any particular highlights of, of the year? Well, the, the festival itself was a tremendous achievement, I think, because normally we just play a long set on the Saturday evening. Um, this year, for instance, we did 37 numbers, which took shade over four hours wow. um but the year before um, you know 1997 we did um, this we, we played both nights and we actually uh, successfully i believe um illustrated the whole 30 year history of the band obviously we couldn't get back everybody that had been involved in those years because i mean you know quite a few of them had passed on and, and <laughs> others are unavailable and so forth but we did um over the two nights 61 numbers and that was you know over six hours and we represented music from every single period i think every single record you know had um, something lifted off it and performed for the 23,000 people who came along and uh, the organization of that was something to be proud of um and ashley hutchings who i referred to as the band's original bass player after his, because um, we did it chronologically, obviously, after his departure from the band, um, uh, he became, if you like, a narrator and told the story of what happened next and who joined and where the material was gleaned from and this sort of stuff. So it became a, more than just a performance. It became a real chronicle and uh, a very entertaining one. And we're fortunate enough to have captured it, or enough of it, to represent on a triple CD box set that we brought out just afterwards. So that was the highlight of my 30th birthday as, as a member of Fairport. Apart from, obviously, experience and longevity, what, what qualities does uh, Fairport 1998 have that Fairport 68 perhaps didn't? Well, the obvious answer to that is experience. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully um, a strongly developed sense of, of good taste. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We certainly... Um, I think we're we're all performing better now as individuals than we were. You know, we've 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 polished our craft and learned more about what makes a good show. And you know, we don't take so many sort of leaps in the dark, uh, which you know is what young bands are very good at, and, and which very often produce startlingly good things. And I'm all in favour of, of young musicians doing that. But uh, I guess you know. As you get more mature, you, you probably do get a little bit more stable, say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the enthusiasm is, is, you know, without sounding too smug, I must stress that Fairport is uh, just as highly motivated as ever we were and um, just better at our jobs now. But I would hope that would be the case whether I was like a, you know, a carpenter or a brain surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> How do you find your audiences have changed over the years? Sorry, just going to have a sip. That's all right. How do you think the audiences have changed? Well, I think they've, a lot of them have grown up with us. Um, 
there are obviously there's a backbone in the audience that does go back a ways and uh, you know they're 40 somethings now too but um, we have a broader spread at the same time um, of ages than we did when we started out we have a lot of youngsters who who have come along and discovered the band in the last incarnation who don't find any sort of burden of, of history they just judge us in the, in the context of the way we play the night and, you know the other bands they saw last week and if you're getting through to you know the 16 and 18 year olds uh, on the basis of your performance then hey there's a future now, early in the year Dave Maddox decided to uh, to uh, part company with the band uh, yeah. which obviously would be a huge loss well it is the fourth time he's left <laughs> <laughs> you know, on, I got you on a point of detail there, but yeah, I mean, nobody ever really leaves Fairport. Yeah, and, you know, we all still continue to to work with each other on outside projects. You know, we're we're, you know, we're all in the same sort of pool generally, even if we're not in the band at the same time. You know, when Martin Orcock left uh, a couple of years ago, I mean, I I saw him last night. I bumped him in the pub. You know, that's the sort of thing. The way it happens. Uh, and you know, you never really leave Fairport until they nail the lid down. That's my <laughs> what, what's Dave working on at the moment? Do you know? Um, he's very involved in in um, what started out as a as a, a jazz trio, piano, bass, and drums that, that he was sort of using as you know in his extracurricular stuff, and that's now grown to a, a seven piece. And he's very much involved in that. And they're very highly thought of. They're called Sept Piece. Um, in addition, he's you know still a very much in demand uh, session player because you know that's it. his real skill is is he's a very musical drummer and he thinks um, very quickly in the studio and his contributions are very um, he's a very pithy player when you get him in the studio it's, it's it's good stuff that he comes out with and he's great listening to you know young people's new songs and finding a context for him. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's doing great. He didn't he didn't perform this year at Cropperty because he only left in March, but I'm sure we'll see him back again at uh, next year's yeah. reunion. Now, if the uh, proposed Australian visit uh, comes together, uh, what lineup would we expect to see down here? It'll be the, the sort of the, the lightweight four-piece, um, let's call it unplugged or acoustic version of the mm-hmm. I don't think we'll be bringing our, our drummer over, who is, you know, we're, we're now really basically a four-piece that occasionally employs a drummer, in this case, Jerry Conway, for the bigger stuff, for the, for the, for the festivals and maybe for the records and the winter tour that we do here, which this year will be, well, next year, rather, will be in February, March time. But uh, the scale of things is, is working much better with, with uh, Dave Pegg, myself, Rick Sanders and, and Chris Leslie. And uh, are we looking at any particular time frame here, or is it still up in the air? Well, at the moment, I mean, it, you know, you're never on a plane until you're on the plane. But <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, we're we're hoping to be um, coming out to the the Woodford Festival uh, between Christmas and New Year. Oh, terrific! And then we'd be around. Uh, well, the schedule's still up in the air, but we if it happens, and we'll be around till uh, I think um, the final gigs in in Hong Kong in uh, early February. Excellent. So we'll certainly be in your town. Oh, that'll be great. Forward to that. Well, we're looking forward to it, and I tell you. Always welcome, um, always welcome visitors down here. Well, it's always a wonderful place to come and tour, I tell you. Now, if some of the distances are a bit daunting. <laughs> now, I believe you, uh, at the moment, as we speak, you're in the middle of working on, on a video project of uh, the festival just gone. Of last weekend's festival, yeah. yeah we've, uh, um, we've, we're just boiling down the, um, the, it's, it's not, going to be a record of the entire festival it's just a record of the festival um the, the fairport festival set which was as i say 37 numbers so there's a lot of audio tape to be waded through and i think you know the odd little cheat here and there to tidy up <laughs> fluffed lyric that yeah. sort of thing you know um and then the editing the, the once that's out of the way which i think we're going to finish this evening um then the then the, we actually start putting it to the pictures and hopefully it will be out um, in a matter of about six weeks or so. If if they can get a broadcast for it, they'll do that too. But I think it's being perceived generally as a sell-through item. Right. Oh, so soon. That's fantastic. We'll yep. look forward to that. 
Okay, Simon, look, I won't hold you up any longer. I'm sure you've got uh, plenty to I'll do there. I'll get back in our studio. The, yep. sun is, the sun is blazing down. It's yet another beautiful day here. Really? Yeah. The, the summer finally happened. Excellent. <laughs> Well, we look forward to uh, catching you down here in the middle of our summer, and we'll try and turn on a good one for you here, too. Oh, not too high. No, no. <laughs> well, thanks very much, John. Thanks, thanks for... Simon. All the best. Uh, thank you for calling me rather than making me call you. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you take care. Yeah, we'll... Take care, and Hope... lots of love to all my friends out there. Nice, certainly. Bye now. Okay, see you later.